chapter 31. Well, this is going great for Jacob, but the sons of Laban are not excited about what is happening because they are watching their father's flock dwindle down and Jacob's flock get bigger and bigger. And it's happening because of what God is doing, not because of what Jacob is doing here. And Jacob heard the words of Laban's son saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all of this wealth. An absolute lie. But the weak person will make that excuse. (laughs) They had done everything that they could to manipulate and take advantage of Jacob. And now when God turns it around on them, they make Jacob look like the heavy, the wrong guy, like he's the one that's been doing what's wrong here. And it's not true at all. Not true at all. And so they look and they say, he's taking our father's wealth. This is is what he's doing. He's he's ripping ripping us off. And they're jealous of God's blessing in, in, in this man's life. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable to him as before. There's a strained relationship here. And then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred. And then gives him those wonderful words of comfort. And I will be with you. And it's very important before making that kind of a move to have that kind of a word from the Lord. It's very clear. The time is up. It's been 20 years now, Jacob. Six years handling these flocks. It's time for you to get on with what it is that I have next for you in your life. And so it's time to move on. And it's interesting to me here because it has a, it's an interesting illustration of what happens in our lives today sometimes, even within the body of Christ. That sometimes God takes us and He puts us places for a time. He puts us with certain people in certain places, in certain situations, so that we might learn what we are supposed to learn in that time, and in that place, and in that situation, and with those people. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we are going to be there forever. God forever holds the freedom to move His people around whenever He wants to move His people around. And it's time for Jacob to move on. He's absolutely free to move on to the next place that God has for him. Now, the interesting thing to me is he has all that is necessary for him to do that. And that is God's Word. It's time to move on. But he's going to, in the following verses, get his wives together, and then he's going to kind of have a confab, and he's going to tear down the situation that he's leaving in order to justify leaving it. And there's no need for it. Because he's not leaving because the situation is bad. He's leaving because God has told him to leave. And how many times in the body of Christ I have seen people leave churches. And they leave the church simply whatever church and come here or leave here to go someplace else for the simple reason that God has said Where you are, you've learned what I want you to learn there. And now I have created a dissatisfaction in your heart. I've heated things up around your life. Not to just singly make you miserable, but so that you would be open to leaving. And now I give you direction. I want you to move from here, and I want you to move over to here. God must always be free to do that in all of our lives in the body of Christ always free to do that. But when he does that, and if he does that, I don't need to tear down what I'm leaving. I just need to say, this is what the Lord has told me to do. And I know to do what the Lord has told me to do. There's a beautiful picture here. Beautiful picture. Guilt-free. We ought to be always guilt-free free and listening to God and obeying God. And so here he is in, in this uh, whole uh, situation. It's turned into uh, uh, the, a bit of a mess and, he, and God is moving him out of it. And then the Lord said to Jacob, as he, again, verse 3, Return 
And so Jacob sent, and he called Rachel and Leah to the field to his flock. So he calls them off. He's going immediate obedience. And he said to them, I see that your father's countenance, that it is not favorable towards me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And, and that is a, a great encapsulation of this chapter, by the way. But God, we see it over and over and over again. Now, let me say one other thing before we proceed in this chapter. This chapter is a wonderful chapter in terms of instruction on interpersonal relationships. <laughs> and it is wonderful instruction on how to deal with difficult people. Now, there's not a difficult person in this room, I understand. You and I are not difficult people, but don't, there's an awful lot of those difficult people out there, aren't there? So we need to know how to deal with them. But there are difficult people. There are Labans out there. And again, there are manipulators out there. You ever known a manipulator? Oh, yes, they're there. They're out there. <laughs> and we've all got a little bit of that inside of us. We've all got a little bit of Laban inside of us, a little bit of Jacob inside of us. And so we get great, great instruction in this particular passage on how to deal with these kinds of, of situations. And so... He takes and he says, but God, the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might, this man had a work ethic. I have served your father, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. And if he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all of the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all of the flocks were streaked. And so God, now he realizes it, wasn't his great and crafty, you know, study of, uh, you know, all of this, uh, the, you know, gene pool and, and all this kind of stuff. He says, so God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. He gives God all of the credit here. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream and behold the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked and speckled and, and gray spotted. And then the angel of the Lord spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes now and see all of the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked and speckled and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing for you. No, he's doing to you. I've seen it. You're my son. I see what's going on. And what God gives him, gives him a dream of what God is doing. And this is why the Bible teaches that we must be very careful not to just take what we see in the natural into account, but that which is unseen. And there's so much going on in the unseen realm when God makes a promise, He will do whatever is necessary, and, and, he, and He's very frequently He doesn't clear it through me. And, and, uh, and I find out subsequently that he's, that he's been doing this. But He gives Jacob a flash in terms of what's happening. Here's Jacob with this whole flock of solid colored um, animals. And then yet, as, as Jacob is dreaming, how in the world am I going to get a speckled animal out of this flock? God begins to show him what God was doing, even in the solid colored animals. You know, He made what they were about speckled. He made their gene pool where that was the dominant thing. And so he just took over the whole system. So it didn't matter what was there and what was happening and what was seen. God was going to be true to His Word. And he was true to His Word. And I am the God of Bethel. Now, you remember me 20 you know, years ago, Jacob, where you anointed the pillar and there and where you made a vow to me such as it was? Now arise and get out of this land and return to the land of your kindred. And then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, Is there any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? You're right, he's been a crumb. And are we not considered strangers by him for he sold us and has completely consumed our money. And, and he did. And, and Jacob had worked hard in order to provide a dowry for them. And a dowry was simply alimony in advance. So that if your husband dumped you, you already had the money. You already had the house. You already had whatever. I mean, the women had very few rights in those days. And so, and, and here is the father who's supposed to be holding this, and he squanders it all. He squandered, and they, and they took note of it. But they also understood 
what was happening there, for all of these riches, verse 16, which God has taken from our Father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. That is maybe the greatest advice in the whole Bible. (laughs) And you know what, ladies? It is wonderful to hear it from a wife even when it means pulling up roots and making the changes and all of these things, when a wife will stand by a man and say, well, whatever God has told you, you go ahead and do that. What that produces in a man, uh, a millennium of nagging will never produce. (laughs) And so it is wonderful, that kind of encouragement from a wife. And then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on camels. And he carried away all his livestock and all his possessions which he had gained, his acquired livestock which he had gained in uh, Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Now Laban had gone to shear his sheep. And he's about three days' journey away from them. And Rachel had stolen the household idols that were her father's. And, uh, and, and, and Jacob stole away unknown to Laban the Syrian in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. Let me say something about Rachel stealing her father's idols. It is very interesting that when we grow into adulthood, how sometimes as we look back upon our childhood, even difficult times in our childhood, Uh, even areas in which our parents were wrong in what they did and how they did things and what they worshipped and how they, you know, did the things that they did. Sometimes, just by virtue of the fact that it is familiar to us, it has a warm place in our heart. And and, and I'm, I'm certain that that is placed there by God with the desire that people would raise their children in the Lord, and then when they get older, they would look back warmly upon the security of of that wisdom and that household, and then model their life after that. But not all of us have been raised in godly homes. And sometimes there can be things that the parents have done There can be gods or priorities that were a part of our household. And these things want to become a part of our lives too. And there's there's a warmth of of the familiarity of of the idols. And we're tempted to partake of them. And we must be very careful to take and weigh them by the Word of God. And if they don't match the Word of God, they must go. And you break the cycle as it relates to moving on and into, then into our children. It's important to do that. And so she takes the idols. And I think that she still has some kind of an attachment in some way to that. And she shouldn't have taken it. She should have left it. But there's power there. There's power there. And that's where we, God calls us to break away from those things completely. And so she steals them. In verse 20 again, And Jacob stole away. Unknown. He's sneaking. He's sneaking. He's a grown man and he's sneaking. Have you ever found yourself when you're dealing with a Laban, a manipulator, that you just say to yourself, this is so humiliating sneaking around them, but I just don't want to deal with them. That's, That's where he's at. He just comes down to this level. He steals away unknown to Laban the Syrian and that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. So he's not only stealing away, sneaking, he's running away. And so he fled with all that he had. He arose and crossed the river and headed towards the mountains of Gilead. And God isn't going to let him get away that way. There just comes a point where God says, I'm not going to let you just sneak away and send postcards from Canaan back to to Laban. I'm I'm not going to reinforce that in your life, Jacob. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to force you to deal with this situation and this man as unpleasant as it is in a mature way, in a a proper way. And so uh, he's trying to run away from his problem here instead of dealing directly with it. It's a tendency that we can all have. But... 
if we are right and we are obeying God and His Word and His promises, then there's no need for us to sneak. I think that there's a great need in the body of Christ to be compassionate in our dealings with one another, but to be direct in our dealings with one another. Instead of sneaking around in different things, and sneaking around as it relates to difficult people sometimes. And we can all be difficult people. But God wants to confront Laban with what he's like. And he also wants to change this pattern that is in Jacob of just always running away, always running away, finding the easy way out and just and moving it in that kind of way. He wants him to learn to stand up. Stand up to this manipulator. Stand up to this Laban. <laughs> wanted to produce character in Jacob's life so that Jacob wouldn't sneak around away from these problems as a means of, of solving them that doesn't solve anything at all. Manipulation is sin. It's sin. <laughs> and when a person is a manipulator, it's sin. And manipulation is basically when someone comes into my life and tries to remove my freedom of choice. And they work in a way in terms of circumstances or in terms of words to back me into a corner where I feel guilty for making an honest, open choice. And so they move in and that's the, they take and they do everything that they can to remove our freedom to say no to them. And then when we say no, to have that decision to be honored. You ever had these people phone you to sell you something at dinner time? Oh, they've made me mad at times. Have you, have you ever had one yell at you and then hang up on you and you don't know where they come from? <laughs> you don't know who they... I mean, I got... I mean, by the time I've hung that phone up, I've got the yellow pages, and I'm the, what was the name of that business? I'm telling you, it got me so mad. How do you get my gun? That's why I don't have a gun. But I, we've had them. We've had them where they've just been as rude as can be. And they come in, uh, Hi, Mr. Kyle, can I just have a moment of your time? We're offering you the world tonight. And uh, for, you know, a mere $40 per year. And on and, and I mean, they, they take some kind of class that doesn't, uh, that allows them to talk for five minutes without breathing. They have some kind of a, a lung capacity that's quite amazing. I think it's part of the prerequisite for getting this job. And isn't that right, Mr. Kyle and Mr. Kyle and Mr. Kyle and Mr. Kyle? Yeah, you don't know me, you know call me. Nobody calls me Mr. Kyle. And so Mr. Kyle, Mr. Kyle, it rose me cord, Mr. Kyle. And so and on and, and the whole thing. And then you, you finally catch them at a breath. And, and then you try to put a stop. And then they, it's just like a, a, a pinball. I mean, then they're off on the next thing. Well, we'll add this to this, Mr. Kyle. And we'll throw in a free TV and all. And what is... They're manipulating me. They're trying to manipulate me. They will not take no for an answer. And I, and I talked to one of these guys the other night as I was canceling something. <laughs> when I signed up for it, they told me that I could cancel with a simple phone call. I, and I'm a wiser man than that. I know better than... I know better than... Uh, but I did it! And so I, they caught, and then, and, and I'm just trying, and he's turning and offering more, and, and we'll give you the state of California. I don't want the state of California. I want Arizona. That's where everybody's moving. Or Idaho, you know, Montana. And, and all, just, and everything, and then, and then fi the guy goes on, and I said, I am trying to be nice to you. And I'm trying to be very diplomatic with you, but you told me that I could make a choice, and if I didn't want it, I could simply tell you that I didn't want it, and you would honor that choice. He was very mad. Uh-huh, up on me. It's manipulation. Now, that's the extreme. Uh, the more subtle ones are, are, are the ones that are even more difficult. When they're not on the phone, they're in your family. Or they're a neighbor, they're a classmate, or a co-worker, something like that. 
But I think that Gail Irwin has the greatest response. By the way, if you deal with manipulation and you have never seen Gail Irwin's video on dealing with manipulators, it's a, it is the classic. It is the classic on that. And what he says to a person when they come to him to, to try and re remove his freedom to say no, he says uh, to them, the moment he senses that it's happening to him, he says, I, I feel like I'm not being given the ability to make a free choice, and, and thus I must tell you no. And, and, and that, that's what he says, and, and he closes it down. But, uh, you know, uh, he, he, with this warning, that a good manipulator will never let it stop there. He knows he's been checkmated, but he, he'll never stop there because then what he will move on to is try and get you to explain why you're telling him no. And as soon as you feel that you must give him an answer, you're dead. You're dead because he's got you manipulated again. And then you give him an answer and then he checkmates that answer and you give him another answer and checkmates that answer. And they're typically brilliant people, great minds. They're three steps ahead of you and I in, in the whole thought process and everything. And by the time the whole scene has played itself out, you've said yes to them because you've forgotten what the question was to begin with and you hate yourself for having done it. You go, they got me again. Oh, I, I just hate myself. I hate it when they do that. <laughs> and God takes with Jacob and He's going to make him face his manipulator so that he will then be able to the rest of his life deal with those who attempt to manipulate him. Don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to say no. And don't resort as, as, as Christian people. There's no need to sneak. Address things. And, and our freedom of choice must be honored by people. And so this is what God is going to send Laban. He could have just let him sneak off, but he's going to send Laban because he wants to also teach Laban something. And Laban was told in the third day that Jacob had fled and then he took his brethren with him and pursued him for seven days' journey and overtook him in the mountains of Gilead. But God came. Here's that but God. God protects us in these dealings. Be sure that when you're dealing with this kind of person, God is working both ends. But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. You watch yourself, buddy. And what God is revealing here is that Laban had no intention of letting Jacob get away with what he was walking away with. Those flocks, those herds, and his family. And God warns him, beautiful, God's protection of Jacob, His protection of us. And so Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountains, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mountains of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you've stolen away unknown to me and carried away my daughters like captives taken with the sword? And here he comes in, and again, it's manipulation. It's the very manipulation that Jacob tried to run away to get away from. Here he is. Oh, oh. He's as phony as can be. And here you're opening wine. And where are you gone? I mean, this is the thing I was afraid of. Because what has Laban done? What every manipulator will do. The incredible capacity of turning everything around on you. Everything around on you. Why did you flee away secretly and steal from me and not tell me? Did he really steal from him? For I, I might have sent you away with joy and songs with timbrel and harp. I hope you're feeling bad. I tell you. It's just, you know, heaping, heaping. And you did not allow me to kiss my sons and my daughters. 
And now you've done foolishly in so doing. And it's in my power to do you harm. Not true. But the God of your father spoke to me last night saying, be careful that you, do, that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. Mm-hmm. And so he had come to do him harm. And since he'd been foiled in that, now he gropes for a reason for chasing him out there. So he says to him, and so, and now you have surely gone because you greatly long for your father's house, but why did you steal my gods? That is one of the most pathetic sentences in the whole Bible. (laughs) You went and ripped off my God. (laughs) Well, what kind of a God can you rip off? Oh, you went and took the little guy. (laughs) That's no God, that's a good luck charm. So here's, I mean, this is why, and the guy doesn't even know what he's saying. It's, it's absolutely pathetic. You, you went and stole my God. Ran away with him. I had to put him on a milk cart. I was going to get him out here and find the guy, the little guy here. to put him. Hmm. Aren't you glad that you have a God that can't be stolen? We can, we can never leave His presence. We're never like out of His radar. You know? Oh, you went, went behind a hill? My God's, you know, powerless of these hills. It's like Krypton. So here He comes in and he doesn't, he doesn't see, and that's the folly of idolatry. He can't for the life of Him see the foolishness of that, following a God that can be stolen. And Jacob had answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid... Uh, because I was afraid, for I said, perhaps you would take your daughters from me by force. I was doing what I was doing out of the fear of man. With whomever you find your gods, don't let him live. He doesn't know that Rachel's taken. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent first. You're a little scamp. You've got it. And then into Leah's tent. And then into the two maids' tent. But he did not find them. And then he went out of Leah's tent. And again, pathetic. Here's a man that's looking under, he's looking under blankets and all kinds of things. Where'd he go? Where'd I put? And then he went out of Leah's tent and he enters Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the, ca- in the camel's saddle and sat on them. And Laban searched all about the tent but did not find them. And she said to her father, and you can tell that he is her father at this point, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of woman is with me. And he searched but did not find the household idols. And then Jacob was angry and he rebuked Laban. Now Jacob is finally going to stand up to Laban. And he stands up to him in anger. And we know better than to deal with these situations in anger. That's the flesh. doesn't work the righteousness of God. Why does Jacob stand up in anger at this particular point? Because he's waited 20 years to deal with the situation. 20 years to deal with it. It is so important for us to deal with situations before they are that ripe and before we are that angry. We don't want the sun to go down on our wrath. These things are to be dealt with immediately and swiftly while they're smaller. And so here's a situation where and you, when you find yourself and I find myself blowing up over some kind of, you know, and they got a five minutes later and all that kind of thing. Ooh, we have waited way too long to address a situation. Way too long. And he has. So it's not commendable in the anger. That's not good. But he's finally addressing the situation. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that you have so hotly pursued me? Although you have searched all of my things, what part of your household things have you found? 
set it here before my brethren and your brethren, that they may judge between us both. These 20 years I've been with you. I've been an excellent shepherd. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried their young. I've not eaten the rams of your flock, and it was the right of a shepherd to do so. And that which was torn by the beasts I didn't bring to you, I bore the loss of it. And you required it from my hand, whether it was stolen by day or stolen by night. You made me bear all of the losses. And there I was, and the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. And thus I have been in your house twenty years. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times, and unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, who was the fear of Isaac? Jehovah, had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. And so now... Jacob finally sees that God has been protecting him as it related to this manipulator all along. God has been protecting him. And Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters. These children are my children. And this flock is my flock. And all that you see, not true, but he's got to save face. But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have borne? Now therefore, come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. And so Jacob took a stone and he set it up as a pillar. And then Jacob said to his brethren, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there on the heap. There's a restaurant name for you. And Laban called it this in the Aramaic. And Jacob called it Galid, far easier, in the Hebrew. And they called this pile of stones the heap of witness or the heap of testimony. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, the name was called Galid, also Mizpah, which means watch. Now, Maybe you have, and I don't want to bum you out as it relates to your jewelry collection, but if you've ever had what's called a mizpah ring given to you or a mizpah necklace, it's one of those necklaces where it's you've got like a round circle and it's broken in half and then one partner gets the one piece and the other partner gets the other piece so that when, you know, the boyfriend and the girlfriend get together or whatever, and then the two pieces are put together, then they're one. And, and so it, it's called a mispa ring. And uh, it's, it's very wonderful in terms of that concept, but uh, its biblical basis is a little more hostile than that. A little more suspicious. And they call it mispa, they call it watch, because Laban is saying, I don't trust you, buddy. And so I ask that God would watch you. And Jacob says, I don't trust you. And so I'm going to ask God to watch you. Now, hopefully our mispa rings aren't with, with that kind of a tone. That'd make for, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, a, a hostile, more hostile than we like uh, our marriage relationships and engagement relationships to be. And so, because he said, may the Lord watch you, since I can't, between you and me, uh, when we are absent from one another. And if you afflict my daughters, he has a high opinion of Jacob, or if you take other wives besides my daughters, although no man is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. And then Laban said to Jacob, here is this heap and here is this pillar which I have placed between you and me. And now they're going to make a clean break from one another. There's nothing wrong when God works things in our lives that produce a clean break from certain people. 
Now make sure that he produces that break, but there's nothing to feel guilty about when a break is occurring and, and of necessity, and that's the case here. And so they're, they're creating a, a break. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness that I will not pass beyond this heap to you, and you will not pa- pass beyond this heap and this pillar to me for harm. And the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us. And Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, And then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and called his brethren to eat. And they ate bread and stayed all night on the mountain. And early in the morning Laban arose and kissed his sons and daughters and blessed them. And then Laban departed and returned to his place. And so the split occurs. And we'll pick it up in chapter 32 next week.